get ready. What a beautiful valley. I think we came up this on the first day, if I remember that, uh, that railway track there in the middle of the valley. I think I remember uh, seeing that. Mountain range down here. Welcome to the district of Stirling. Loch Lomond and the Trussocks National Park, the Trussocks. I've heard some of the lads talking about this, it's supposed to be beautiful. I think the Trussocks is mainly on the uh, eastern coast of uh, Loch Lomond. Uh, well, this is amazing, look at this, beautiful. This isn't the Green Welly again, is it? It is too. Oh, oh, bunk. <coughs> yeah, I didn't plan to be here twice, but uh, I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. I'm fully fueled. I bought my. Uh, stickers and magnets for my little mementos the last time I was here so uh, I'm fed and I'm watered I know what it looks like why don't you indicate not be indicate not as you're doing it it's called an indicator for a reason not a duocator you don't put it on when you're doing it you put it on before you do it so I know what you're going to do Indicate, not do a case. Oh, here we go. Now, this is the problem. I think uh, I think I'd seen this, I think, in either Mapped or one of those guys that uh, this road can be uh, can get pretty busy with traffic. Yeah, oh, sure. there's an idea. I could go down that river road again. But uh, I don't want to risk, I could probably add an hour or so on, I don't want to risk my timings. Uh, so I'll, uh, well, I could be risking my time and staying on this road if the, uh, the traffic is heavy. But look, we're moving, so. I mean, the good thing about this sat nav is that because you link it to your phone with uh, the Bluetooth tethering, it then takes in the, uh, the traffic information from Google feeds it into the uh, sat nav so I can actually see here it show me where there are road works or traffic jams and that should be pretty much live information it updates as it uh, as you go oh, that's heavy oh. so the timing it's given me should have already accounted for any delays for uh, heavy traffic and or um, roadworks. Police unmarked motorcycles in operation. Jeepers, I didn't realize that. Unmarked motorcycles. Although I remember seeing a thing before about an unmarked motorcycle in the UK and he was using a V4 800, the FI one I think it was, a silver one, and Jesus he could move with that, he was up to 150, 160 miles an hour, he was barreling down, people tearing off thinking that they couldn't, he couldn't keep up, but by God he could move. Oh, you know what people don't realise is, like, like my Blackbird, you know, just because you have a 200 mile an hour motorbike doesn't mean you can get it to 200 mile an hour to know what you're doing. You'll know all about it if you're at 150 miles an hour and the, and the bike goes into what's commonly known as a tank slapper or a wobble. 
the front wheel goes light and starts to wobble around it, it can escalate very quickly. A lot of guys put steering dampeners on their bikes to, uh, to, to prevent that from happening. But it can even happen at low speeds. I've, I've had it happen at about 60, 70 miles an hour. Terrifying. this for three kilometers uh, so these three bikers up ahead are stuck behind this uh, camper van they're all stuck behind it see this is why I like to uh, <coughs> I like to have a bit of time built in for the contingency in case the sat nav is uh, is wrong or you have a breakdown or a puncture or traffic that extra hour or so uh, is a good buffer. You know, it, it, it takes a little bit of stress out. Oh, was that, was that a GS? Funny looking looking colour scheme. There's a load of lads now. Harley's waving. That's what I mean about cyclists. Look, one cyclist dawdling along. Everyone has to wait for her. Where are we going? We're going straight through this roundabout. So we might lose a few of these there. We're going straight. Oh, I forgot to power on my. Uh, I was wondering why Darth Vader wasn't talking to me yet. I haven't powered on my communicator. I suppose I better do that. So Darth Vader is back in my head. <coughs> Barking orders. Oh, that's the... Uh, the car in front of me, the Kodiak. Skoda Kodiak. I definitely think that's going to be my next car. I bought a Skoda Superb and it's uh, not just a clever name, it is superb, fantastic car, best car I've ever had, good looking car now, I know people write off Skoda because of the name but uh, it's a whole lot of car for uh, a reasonable amount of money, I was going to buy the Audi A4, I picked it out, specced it out, put the deposit and everything on. And then I was leaving, and uh, they had a Skoda dealership next to it, somewhere by the same dealership. I just said, oh, I don't love the Skodas, I'll just have a quick look. And I went in, and they had this stunning Superb there. And I had much more stuff in it than the Audi had. It looked better, certainly, on the outside than the Audi did. I was about five grand cheaper. 
and then when I was speaking to the uh, sales guy, it turns out that they have, because they're owned by Volkswagen, the Audi A4, the Skoda Superb, and the Volkswagen Passat all have exactly the same engines, they all have exactly the same chassis. The only difference is the interior and the out outer bodywork, but they're essentially all the exact same car. So why would I pay more money for the Audi A4 and the Volkswagen when I can get the exact same car with more stuff in it for a lot cheaper? And this Kodiak thing is a savage out. Big 4x4, proper SUV type thing. Beautiful inside. Absolutely stunning. So I think uh, I'm due to replace my car now at the end of this year. I think I'll go for, for one of these babies here. Cracking yoke. Very, very good car. I mean, it's the equivalent of a Q5, an Audi Q5. And for a fraction of the cost. Uh, or, or a BMW X5. Just as good. And we'll get to keep up all the money. Oh, this is savage. I don't think I did this coming up because we took the, uh, the little back river road, which is amazing, which is probably the best road I've done here. But uh, I don't think I did this one coming up. So it's nice. Well, maybe I did, but I don't remember it. I don't think I did. I mean, look at that Range Rover there in front. I mean, it's, a, it's equivalent with that Skoda. I think the Skoda looks better. I guarantee it has more uh, tech in it. And I guarantee it's at least 10 or 15 grand cheaper. It's a no-brainer for me. enjoying this drive now it's such a nice pleasant drive so stress-free that's the thing like I'd, I'd, I'd hate to be someone who has to drive or commute to work on the bike I used to do it for a couple of years but it just takes all the joy out of the bike you know because you're driving and commuting rush air traffic everyone's trying to kill you particularly on the M50 back home in Dublin they're all just out to kill you. It's stressful. And then when you get to the weekend, the last thing you want to do is get back in your bike. So it was ruining it. Plus it's racking up the miles on the bike as well. Oh, I did come this way. The Falls of Follock. We did come this way. So yeah, I, I don't... Way hey, jeepers, you're all jamming on a bit too soon there. But, uh... But yeah, I'd hate to, uh... I'd hate to uh, have to commute every day to work on the bike. Uh, it just takes all the joy. Oh, that's nice. Uh, it takes all the joy out of it. For me, the bike should be a, an escape, you know, not uh, not a workhorse. I'm just lucky to be in a position that I can do that, I suppose. Uh, those lads are shooting off, Alan. This is this is the Wicklow Mountains. So I'm not home. Well, I can definitely say Scotland more than delivered. I mean, you don't have to do the North Coast 500 route. I mean, I I followed it loosely. There's probably sections of it I missed, and I bolted on Sky, the Isle of Sky, and a few other bits and bobs. But uh, you don't have to follow it to the letter. I mean, it's just a, a rough uh, guide. Because it's all good. Every bit of it. I'll probably do this trip now next year with the brother, the missus, and the... And then the year after that, or, the, or, or I might do it twice next year, or whatever. I don't know. I'm still to decide what I'm going to do. But uh, whatever I do, I'll do this one again first. 
and then I'm going to do a bit of a mix of the Western Isles and this, probably more the Western Isles. I'd like to get up into those Orkneys and uh, the Isle of Mull and, and all of that, you know. Uh, the only thing about that is you have to apparently pre-book ferries. And I, and, and I don't want to get into pre-booking things because I'm locking yourself into a... Uh, into a schedule then you know it's like the lock it's like the book of the hotels you know you know you have to be somewhere at a certain time and ferries are worse because if, you, if you're not there at the time you've missed them and it completely banjos the whole uh, trip so um, we'll see but I would like to do more of those Western Isles and the Orkneys you know I think they'd be interested. I'd like to get up to the Shetlands actually, that'd be cool. Great TV show, I can't remember what it's called. Crime drama, British crime drama set up in the Shetlands. But they're only small, the thing about those crime dramas is a small little island. And they've a different murder every week. Jeez, the crime rate must be huge. <coughs> oh yeah, this is Glen Delock. It's almost identical. But yeah, I'm gonna do uh, this. I'm gonna I'm gonna do Scotland every year now <coughs> for uh, the next foreseeable future. That's for sure. I'd like to do Iceland. I think that would be good. And I'd like to do bits of Norway. I was gonna do the. I think I said it before. I was gonna do the uh, Nord Cap, but uh, I don't know. I don't think it's hard to be in. That's a long, long, long trip, <coughs> and it would be exorbitantly expensive. Uh, but I would like to do bits of it. I'll go over and do some of the uh, the west coast, do some of the fjords and stuff like that. I'd see if there's a, a guided tour that I can go and do. Actually, I think the Visit and Flyer did one, if I'm not mistaken. I have a look at that, might have been Celtic Horizons or maybe one of the BMW trips. I don't know if you've ever seen the uh, those guys, the, uh, oh, what are they called? Globe Busters. Uh, the husband and wife team that do the Globe Trotters or Globe Busters, one or the other, I think it's Globe Busters. They do these huge expeditions around the world or transcontinental. I think they were the fastest couple to ever go around the, the world on a motorbike. And funnily enough, their name is. Uh, so my old battery ran out there, but uh, as I was saying, um, yeah, their name is Sanders, Julia and uh, Kevin Sanders, I think their name is. Which is. Uh, Kind of interesting because uh, they're the they're the fastest couple around the world in a motorbike, I believe. And Nick Sanders is the fastest single motorcyclist around the world. Although I don't know if he still holds the title, <coughs> but um, so it's uh, I think it's funny that two uh, two people or three people with the name Sanders are all world crossing speedsters. I'm on Loch Lomond here, look, you can probably see it here beside me, I look in absolutely stunning. Really is a beautiful lock. But, uh, yeah, those Globusters, uh, Julie and Nick Sanders, they do these amazing transcontinental, look at this Egypt, uh, uh, expeditions on motorbikes taking you to places like uh, lower base camp of Everest and but they've produced a couple of videos. Uh, I think the first one was called The Ride and then The Ride 2 or something like that. I'm not sure if they've made any more since, but uh, I think they were done in conjunction with National Geographic or something like that. But they're great videos, really, really good. Uh, 
uh, like these people that go on these trips, they cost about £25,000 sterling and then you'd probably want that again then in spending because you're gone from I think three months up to six months in some cases for the longer ones. But you can see the highs and the lows of the trips, like you can imagine a trip like that, I mean like I'm already tired doing like four, five, six days maybe on the road for three months. You can see the pressure it puts on, on the group, you know, I mean, ultimately they all seem to bond and, you know, but you can see there's, you know, there's a, particularly on, on the Sanders couple, because it, it's not just a trip for them, it's, uh, it's a job, you know, they're there to provide a service for everybody else, and uh, so when they get in somewhere at the end of a day, the job isn't over, they have to go off and get all the, the hotels ordered, meals and any problems and issues that the riders are having sorted and mechanical issues. And, but you can see the pressure it puts on them as a, as a couple, it's tough on them. I'd say it's, it's not easy for them. Uh, but I'd say they wouldn't swap it for the world literally that's what they're getting they get to travel the world constantly I think, I think even Julia Sanders look at this fucking hell she said it you know she she could be sitting in an office taking the bus into work every day or she could be sat in uh, Grand Canyon not really a choice really is it I know which one I'd pick But, uh, you know, traveling like this is, uh, it's amazing. I mean, look at this. <laughs> you wouldn't change it for anything. But it is, uh, it is tiring and it can be stressful and it can be dangerous. As we've seen, you know, slight lapse of concentration. You know, crashing in a, one, in a car is one thing. You know, you get a bit of a ding. Crashing one of these things. And what? should be a small thing can be either life ending or life altering <laughs> so you have to be very careful I think I've already gone through my list of injuries from broken femurs to ribs and noses and fingers and but uh, I wouldn't change it I can't imagine life without a motorbike trip in it because uh, you know I saw with my brother my, my brother had a bad accident a few years ago and I think it it knocked his uh, his confidence a lot it took him a while to get back to the bikes and I'm delighted he did because it's not just about the bike it's a it's a whole lifestyle this is a whole lifestyle it's about the bike, it's about looking after the bike, it's about planning the trip, doing the trip, planning the next trip. It's about getting the gear and the gadgets and the... Uh, right, meeting the people. You know? <coughs> Seeing the countries and travelling and expanding where you've been and... You know, it's a, it's an entire lifestyle, it's not just a hobby, it's a lifestyle. Uh, and sometimes it can take over as well, like, you know, I mean, <coughs> as I said, we've tried to lose a bit of weight and I've recently, over the last few years, tried to get into hiking uh, and cycling. Which I like as well, you know, I love it. Look at this. Beautiful. But what can happen then is that there's a, a battle between your time then, you know. Uh, before all of the, the other stuff, every weekend was about biking. And then of course, you know, hiking comes in and you're like, well, I'm supposed to be going bike biking today. And then the wife will say, well, no, I want to go hiking. You have to make a choice. 
so it's trying to get time to uh, try and strike a balance of uh, well which days am I going to hike which days am I going to bike and which days am I going to hike because there's nothing worse than uh, being a beautiful day and you want to be out on the bike and she wants you to go for a hike but I suppose it's a it's a win-win I suppose I mean first world problems and all that you know oh should I take the motorbike or go for a beautiful walk through the mountains first world problems but uh good god look at this yeah the first world problems is right interesting like here's here's me complaining about how I struggle to find time to, between my hiking and my motorbike and the chap I was talking to last night uh, yeah, in the hotel a Romanian chap telling me that uh, <coughs> basically you only earn something like uh, 900 pounds sterling a month I was like yeah, sure, how could you live on that and that he had sent money back to his mother because they didn't have an oven said he had to save up he got money back from the tax man 200 pound he couldn't believe his luck and he used that money to buy an oven for his mother back in Romania <coughs> she had no oven for six months you know uh, he's living in, in Scotland struggling to make ends meet Trying to buy his mum an oven. I'm complaining about whether I hike a bike, Jesus. Anyway, can't solve the whole world's problems on a motorbike. Jeez, that truck is piddling out water from the cabin for some reason. Why is it coming out of there? What's he carrying? Is he carrying a lake in the back of it or something? It's peeing out water. I'm getting it all over me, I hope it's nothing dubious. What's he carrying to it? Look, it's piddling out the back doors. There's a bigger gap getting covered in whatever that is. <coughs> Look at that. He's probably covered my lens now, has he? Oh yeah, I can think of worse places to be now today. The driving along the banks of Loch Lomond. What a beautiful lake. I mean between that and Loch Ness yesterday, Loch Ness was beautiful as well, oh my god, it locked me socks off now to drive down along Loch Ness. You'd come to Scotland just to drive both of those lakes, I'm telling you, they're beautiful drives. I definitely have to take the car here at some point, do all the boat tours and the... Although I'm a bit hungry now, to be honest. It's my weird appetite acting up again. And I get a big breakfast. And I know if I was to even take a bite of something, I'd be immediately full. Oh, what's our timing like? 2.38. Still, and what time is it now? Oh, it's that pissing out. Look at it. Yeah, that's coming from inside the cabin, the box trailer. That's some nice hotel, the Tarbot Hotel. Beautiful. I'll see if I can get past this truck at some point because I'm getting covered in whatever's spilling out of that yoke. Look at it. Look 
could he possibly have inside a box trailer that's spewing out water? Well, at least I hope it's water because I'm getting covered in it. I need to get past this lad. I'm sick of getting peed on by whatever it is he's carrying. For all I know, he could be carrying big tanks of fish covered here in fish oil or something. big expeditions with uh, Globusters but uh, I'd never afford something like that. I think I mean, that's 50,000 pounds sterling you're talking about. So Jesus. That's crazy money. Maybe if I was a millionaire but uh, that's a lot of money. down to the South Pole and see where Tom Green and uh, Shackleton and Scott and all of them uh, I read the story about Tom Green my brother put me on to him if you ever get a chance, if you're doing the Wild Atlantic Way, go down and do uh, the South Pole Inn it's a pub that uh, Tom Green bought when he finished great story there but uh if you've never heard of Tom Crean, look him up. Definitely one of Ireland's heroes. An amazing, amazing story to Tom Crean. But even better is uh, if you're at the North Pole or the South Pole Inn, just up to the left of it there's a road and you go up and you can see his uh, grave. This bizarre little cemetery that's there. It's a really strange cemetery. His, his tomb is down in the bottom right hand corner just follow the path there's only one path in the whole cemetery you can follow the path all the way to its end and he's right at the end of it but then there's another little lake uh, up that way I can't remember what it's called uh, but a stunning little lake there's a little farmer's gate you have to open to get down onto it close it behind you but a uh, point <laughs> But it's worth going up a little bit narrow. It's stunning. Um, but I always wanted to do a trip to the actual South Pole. You can go there now. There's uh, cruises to take you there. But I was looking at a, I was looking at a YouTube clip about it. Again, it's very expensive. Probably talking, you know, ten grand. The thing about it is to get there, you have to go to Argentina and they take a, a, a boat from Argentina down. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is that the sea, I can't remember the name of the ocean that, uh, that it is, but um, it's obviously one of the wildest oceans uh, in the world. And apparently uh, it's not for the faint of heart, the sailing. Uh, it's uh, you know 50, 60 meter or 50, 60 foot high waves. Well, maybe it is meter. Apparently the ship gets thrown around the place. But it'd be worth it. I think. Look at that dirty bastard throwing out his rubbish as he drives. K U I A Y W B A A H. Dakota UK. Dirt bags. I really don't understand that. Why would you throw your rubbish out as you're driving along? Isn't that disgraceful? Unbelievable. That's annoyed me now. Beautiful place like this and him chucking out his crap. All about health. A-A-H. All about health. Now what about the environment mate? You're chucking your gear out. Disgraceful. But uh, yeah, I'd like to see the South Pole. Uh, 
can if you can survive the voyage, apparently it's amazing. The wildlife and the scenery is supposed to be amazing. But an expensive trip though. Inverbeg. So that's where we're at now, Inverbeg. <coughs> I'll stop bladdering on for a while. See us a bit further down. Uh, so we're down at the bottom of uh, Loch Lomond again. It's a nice looking roundabout. Uh, I don't think we're too far from uh, Erskine Bridge now. <sighs> Take out some of these trucks. Wow, that's nice. But uh, I don't know what was in the back of that other truck earlier, but my bike is covered in crap. Which means I'm covered in it as well, whatever the hell it was. Yeah, the, the sun nav is after knocking up two or three traffic jams there, so it's pushed my time. Even though I gained time, I was down to 2.35. It's now telling me that there's a couple of traffic issues up ahead and it's added back in some minutes, so I'm up to 2.44. So again, it's just highlighting the fact that you need to make sure you're built in contingency when you're on the time schedule for ferries. So there's still plenty of time. I was already there before four o'clock. When they cut off the check-in, we're grand. See, that Porsche now is shifting. Look, we're doing 123. He's got the pulling away there now. Fast joke, all right. I don't think they're the prettiest looking car, but uh, it certainly moves. speed is uh, with all the weight the bike is starting to wobble remember I was saying earlier about the old uh, tank slappers so I don't want to get into a, a race with a bloody Porsche I can feel the front end going light I got too much uh, luggage at the back making the front wheel light any kind of high speed particularly with this high wind the, the back box is acting like a sail front then is starting to uh, it's a wobble on me there that could escalate very quickly so I need to keep the old speed down I want to get home you know I want to get home in one piece here so we're going through straight through this roundabout here Dun, dun, dun. That was the Porsche. There's the Skoda Kodiak again. I caught up with them already. He's fully loaded, that's for sure. Uh, God, my visor is covered in crap from that truck. Oh, that white crap on my uh, visor. The windshield. I won't be getting home till 10 o'clock tonight, so I'm not washing her today. Oh, come on, Kodiak. Uh, it'll be... What are you doing? It'll be Saturday before I get to wash this uh, crud. Look, another Arnold Clark on his... 
But I, I told you that lad sold every car in Scotland. Oh, this is no wonder I caught up with this Kodiak after me stopping. Jesus, what a Miss Daisy. What have you got into the fast lane for? You have to drive fast to get into the fast lane. That's the Mr. Truck there now. That's your man, is it AAH? Eh? Threw all the shit out the window. Jesus, he must have uh, flung it. I thought he had a, a passenger. Uh, because it all came out the passenger side window. There's nobody in the passenger seat, so that means he got all that rubbish, opened the passenger window and threw it all out across. Jesus. There's a police van now. I wonder should I tell them the video evidence? Now here's the traffic jam. This is the traffic jam that the sat nav is showing me, look. Stuck in this bloody traffic for the last 10 minutes. This doesn't look like I'm going to be going anywhere too far soon. Oh, flipping hell. This is a nightmare. It says there's another kilometer of this. This is a blade nightmare. I don't want to uh, don't want to filter up the middle here with these big boxes on. It's still a bit tight and there's a cop van behind me somewhere. This is a, this is a pain in the arse. My clutch hand is killing me from oh, keeping the clutch pulled in. We got one of those DCT drives. Oh, this is a nightmare. Here, we're not far outside Erskine Bridge, I think. So, uh, it says there's only a kilometer and three minutes of this crop left, but that look, I can see way off into the distance. It's more than a kilometer. Definitely more than three minutes. Where is he not moving up? Ridiculous. Drive safely, I can't drive at all. These are the road works, don't look like they're lasting too long, so I don't think these are gonna have much of an impact. But yeah, what a difference, huh? Only moments ago I was up driving, cruising along Loch Lomond. And now I'm on this crap. That's a shame. I like, uh, can officially say the, the holiday bit is over and the, uh, the hard commute home has begun. I'm 
bit windy again. I got a feeling it might rain. Hopefully not. Uh, this is heavy. I said that over there, I love one of them. That would be great crack now. Uh, an awesome yoke. Know. Okay, so 13 kilometers. 142 kilometers in total we have to do now. Nobody wants to get uh, out of the fast lane. The man in the sand has gone up to try and put ahead. Look, nobody's letting him back in. He's going to force his way in now in a minute, I'm sure. Wait and see. He's going to try and force his way in front of me, is he? Fine. People get a bit cranky when you try and undercut them on a motorway like this. It's like a queue. Everyone likes to have their space. Nobody likes anyone getting ahead of them. Yeah, that's the difference about mainland Europe and Ireland and England, I think. Uh, over in Europe, they know how to use the motorways properly. People get confused between what a fast lane and a slow lane is. There's no such thing as a fast lane. It's an overtaking lane. If it was a fast lane, there'd be a different speed limit in this lane than there would be to the lane beside me, but there's not. They both have the same speed limit. Calling it a fast lane suggests that it's a faster lane than the other, but it's not. It's only supposed to be faster because you're only supposed to use it to overtake. So in Europe, they get in, they overtake, and then they get back out of it again. And then it, it keeps the traffic moving. So see this white van up ahead, he's not overtaking. He's, he's driving literally parallel to the car beside. He's not overtaking. He shouldn't be in here. So he should get out. And let anyone else behind him overtake. So the rule is, as soon as you're finished, you're overtaking, get out. But as long as you're still overtaking, you can stay here. And that's my thoughts on it. So if I'm overtaking, somebody comes up my arse and starts flashing because they don't think I'm going fast enough. Well, that's tough diddlers. I'm still overtaking. I'm still using the lane to overtake. And I will continue to do so until I have completed my overtaking maneuver. It is not a faster lane. Like this guy in up front, he's still not overtaking, he's just cruising alongside. Overtaking, get out. Shouldn't be holding anything up. And that's why all these roads, that's why people get frustrated and accidents happen. They feel that they should be going faster here, which they should be, but uh, they don't have a right to go faster, they just have a right to overtake. And when somebody has completed, like this guy here in front, look, he can clearly move in now. He's done overtaking and he won't move. He has done, he's finished his overtaking. Oh, now he's moving, he's finally clocked him. Now these lads, look. Taking their time to do the overtake. The car day. Squad car here. Yeah. Maybe that's why they're all being very extra careful. Drive efficiently. You're dead right. So now I'm past this van. The big gap. I can move out of the overtaking leg because I'm done. And anything behind he wants to get out can go past me now. But now there's a truck in front of me, I've caught up with it. I can go back into the overtaking lane. And then overtake these couple of items. And 
then I can go back in here again and I'm still maintaining my speed. See? That's how you use an overtake lane. You only go into it when you need to. Oh, I think it's going to rain and I don't have my liners in. I'm not sure if this is Glasgow or Erskine Bridge I'm passing now. I think it's Glasgow. I think it's Glasgow. That's rain over there. That is rain. What to do? Will I stop for liners? I'm only on this for another four. I might drive through it. It looks like it's off to the left there. I might be lucky. Use this old overtaking lane again. Oh, there's some funny smell in the air here, I tell you. It's a lucky this isn't smell of vision. Because there is a pong here. Now, where am I going? I'm trying to stay in the three left lanes, sorry, three right lanes, so I'm in this, these lanes, that's okay. Stay here for the moment, I'll stay in the middle so uh, I can uh, switch between either one once I know which way it's taking me. Three kilometers to go to the next one. Oh yeah, it's getting cold now. Jeez, that's a sudden change alright. That is a change. I'll take up my polar visor. What does that, yeah, that doesn't look good at all. Get me to this bloody ferry terminal. Okay, so I'm taking exit. Two kilometers. Let's see if we get it. Oh, so that was a bit funny there, just drove, drove down and all the traffic was slowing down suddenly and swerving around. But I, I, I initially thought it was a moped going down the, the motorway. But then as I came out to overtake it myself, I realised there was a guy on a beautiful, I mean beautiful Ducati Corsair, brand spanking new, all white. A thousand cc yoke, a stunning looking yoke. We need a backpack on him and all, but by God, he looked very shaky on it. Are you doing about 30 mile an hour on the motorway? On a, on a, on a, a rocket ship of a bike. Now it's a bit windy out today, but uh, I'd say uh, Strand Rider 65, so we're on the home stretch. Uh, so yeah, I'd say that's a guy with more money than sense. Thought it'd be a good idea to go out and buy a really flash motorbike. And hasn't learned how to drive it yet. Thought it'd be a good idea to go down the motorway with it in high winds. And uh, he's panicking now. The thing about motorbikes, particularly uh, very powerful bikes, I don't think if you've never driven a fast motorbike before, You'll, uh, you'll have no idea how quick these things are. Not this one now, this, this isn't particularly a quick bike. But something like an R1 or a Fireblade or the BMW S1000. You're talking Formula One car fast. In a straight line type stuff, you know, they're just, they are frighteningly fast. And, uh, like I mentioned before, driving a bike is physical. You don't just turn the wheel. Like, in fact, if you turn the steering wheel on a motorbike going into a sharp bend, you're a dead man. It's not about turning the wheel, it's about leaning the bike over and counter steering, all this type of stuff. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna wrap yourself around a lamppost really quick with a motorbike. When you're learning to drive, it's not about if you're going to crash, it's about when you're going to crash and how bad you're going to crash. I don't know anyone who's driven a motorbike who hasn't come off in one way or another. You know, luckily, uh, 
nothing too serious, but uh, touch wood. <coughs> but, uh, Uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. It used to be a law in Ireland where you had to be 26, I think, years of age before you could buy anything over a 500cc, I think it was. Which kind of makes sense. I didn't like it at the time, but uh, it does make sense. Uh, a lot of people were just going out and buying fire blades and, you know, war once and no train and you can just go in and buy one and off you go and boom showing off and uh, you're a gunner I thought that was a couple of blue lights flashing behind me there for a second it wasn't those ice blue halogens I think in somebody's car But yeah, so uh, if you're thinking about starting out on a bike, I definitely think you should start, although I think you have to now. Something more manageable, a 200 or something, you know. I think they're limited to 33 brake horsepower. Which is still quick. I used to have a Suzuki Bandit limited to 33 brake horsepower. But it's still quick enough. Definitely worth doing the training for. I'm not, I've never been trained properly. I've just been driving so long now, but uh, I, I actually wouldn't mind going back and doing some of the training. As I, as I mentioned before, uh, I seem to be getting worse as I get older. I get more nervous about taking corners and drive, particularly when it's wet. I get very. Uh, I lose all my confidence. So uh, I might actually go back and do a, a ride or training course, you know. Uh, I think it'd be worth it. Maybe a track day or something. Particularly now I have that Blackbird, you know. Uh, that doesn't have all the bells and whistles that this thing, this Beamer has. It doesn't have the traction control or the right position isn't as good. It's not as agile, <clears throat> but it's certainly an awful lot faster. A lot faster. So, uh, harder bike to drive with a lot more power you know so you really don't need to do you know it even frightened me I used to drive I had one like before I used to drive it all the time never thought out and about it but Jesus when I picked this one up you know it really dawned on me how powerful it was and uh, it gave me a shock you know I didn't remember it I mean obviously I remembered it being quick but I forgot how quick or how powerful it is. I mean, it's just... Death Star type of power in it, you know? It's just phenomenal. It, uh, it gave me pause for a moment, you know? Pause for thought. So, oh, Jesus, what have I done here? But sure, look, I can sell it if I... If I uh, if I'm not happy with uh, using it, you know. But sure, look, I'll keep it for a while and see. It's like anything, you, just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do something. I don't have to drive it fast. is uh, still not great but this road's a little bit more manageable I need you coming a railroad up me behind me <coughs> let them go if you're in that much of a hurry mate have at it I am gonna do it. I'm not getting into it I just want to get home safely now yeah, yeah apparently 95% of the crashes are done Five minutes from your home, apparently. Or maybe not that high, but I know it's a high percentage of crashes are usually when you're closer to home because you get more comfortable and more relaxed because you're so used to doing those roads and you let your guard down. Uh, apparently. Pretty
breast wink. Okay, Darth Vader's beeping at me for some reason. Oh, camera zone, we're in a speed camera zone. Oh look, yeah, see them up there. Those are uh, <coughs> average speed cameras, excuse me for coughing. Average speed cameras. They don't work like ordinary speed cameras. They take a snapshot of your edge at one point, then they snapshot it again at another point, 